Welcome to PBL Need to Knows for New Practitioners. I'm Aaron Aldemus, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Sarah Brooks, today. We're both program directors with the Consortium for Public Education. Uh, we're glad to see so many people on this webinar today, uh, especially at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday. So we're glad you're here. So very briefly, just if you're not familiar with the Consortium for Public Ed, we are a 35-year nonprofit based on McKeesport, Pennsylvania. Um, we work with about 60 different school districts across Western Pennsylvania on any given year, plus about 60 community partners and, and business folks. And our work is all focused on future readiness. And when we talk about future readiness, we frame that in terms of three questions. Who am I? Who do I want to be? And how do I get there? Those are questions that we feel all students can engage with at any grade level in some fashion. And it's those three questions that inform all the work that we do whether it's mentoring for middle school students, it's project-based learning, service learning, if it's uh, professional development for educators or school to business partnerships, those questions are always front of mind for us in all the work that we do. And I'm gonna first ask Sarah to introduce herself for, uh, real quick here. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah Brooks, Program Director. Um, Aaron and I work very closely together in uh, a lot of uh, different programming that we have at the consortium. Um, I have background in workforce development and I am a former science nerd and therefore teacher um, of high school students. Um, so my, my bread and butter was um, freshmen. I always enjoyed them quite a lot. And as I mentioned, my name is Aaron Altimus. I'm a Program Director. My background is in STEAM out of school time programming. I was formerly a program director, a 21st century program director with the Wilkinsburg School District and the Woodland Hills School District. And I am a former social studies and English teacher in the Wilkinsburg School District, uh, mostly working with seventh graders. So middle schoolers are always near and dear to my heart. And in terms of PBL, because that's what we're talking about today, here's a little background. So since 2018, Sarah and I have had the privilege to train more than 250 educators in project-based learning. Uh, at first uh, focused mainly here in Western Pennsylvania, but actually last spring, just before we locked down, we expanded our work to New England, uh, working with educators from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. And that was all thanks to a generous grant through the Barr Foundation, which is based out of Boston. So it's been really eye-opening, it's great. We love working with in Western PA, but it's been really eye-opening to also expand and work with some folks from other states. Sarah and I are also certified trainers and facilitators of human-centered design through the Luma Institute. So we think design thinking is an integral part of project-based learning. It really helps take uh, PBL from theory to practice. So we, in our work, we use a lot of design thinking methods to, to impact our PBL work. And this last year, we were selected as uh, one of 17 organizations to support the Grable Foundation's Tomorrow Grant Initiative. We are focusing on 17 different aspects of education. And PBL was one of them. So we're very proud and excited to, to be a part of that work. And we'll be actually be launching a grad level course in PBL uh, aimed specifically at supporting early career teachers. So teachers are in their first five years and uh, creating a cohort of uh, new PBL instructors in, in Pennsylvania. So it's gonna be 100% free. It's in partnership with IU1. Um, it'll be a grad level course about 13 weeks. If you have any uh, folks who meet that, cri that criteria, um, you know, please let us know. We'll have our emails at the end of this, at the end of this webinar, but it's a, it'll be a really exciting course. It even comes with some seed money for projects. So uh, keep an eye out for that information. We'll be launching in, in early March. Now, our work doesn't just uh, extend to, to the classrooms. We also work with um, business partners and, and uh, or other organizations in our region. So we've worked with multinational corporations like Covestro, all the way down to small, you know, one room nonprofits like ourselves, like 412 Food Rescue, um, as well as with working with manufacturers and universities. What we often do is partner schools with businesses uh, to take on real challenges. So students take on a challenge that that business represents. It gives that uh, real world challenge, that authenticity, and uh, it gives an added purpose to what students learn in the classroom. So it's been really exciting. Students get to go out, they get exposure to new industries, new pathways. They get to see how the skills they are applying in the classrooms can be applied to a career later in life. It's really, really interesting work. And it has been very eye-opening for, for Sarah and I. We've been in uh, nuclear power plants, you know, manufacturing facilities. It's just really, really fascinating. And to that end, we still get to work with students. Um, unfortunately, not since about February, 
you know, for obvious reasons. But, you know, if you look closely over on the, over on the right, that's yours truly wearing my hairnet and, and uh, full, full body suit. We were about, I was with a group of students from Clareton. We were about to go into a, a sterilization room in a, in a hospital. Uh, that was back in, I think that was back in February. They were exploring marketing for, for healthcare. A uh, student over on the left was uh, working on a project for a nuclear power plant up in Beaver County. Um, and then the students at the bottom were from City High Charter. They were uh, focused on solving issues in their community based on the UN SDG uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which we'll talk to me a little bit uh, in more detail later. But it's really great. Sarah and I still get to work with kids all the time, which we really enjoy. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we'd ask that all of you, you're all here. What brought you to this webinar? We'd love to hear what interests you most about project-based learning. If you wouldn't mind taking just a minute and, and pop a couple of your, your own thoughts into the chat. So this webinar is, is titled Need to Knows. Uh, in PPL, we often refer to the questions that students ask as things they need to know when they're wrestling with a big question. You know, what do you need to know to solve this problem? So in PPL, implementation in your classrooms, you know, making it actually happen, uh, is kind of the big question that we as educators always wrestle with. And so here are some of the need, we're gonna to discuss today some of the need to knows that come up most often when we're working with folks. And so number one, what is project-based learning, which I'll talk about here. And then I'll be turning it over to Sarah to talk about you know, where do you actually start? How do you do project planning? Uh, how do you balance relevance and rigor? This is one we get all the time. How can I keep my students engaged, which I think is especially relevant now, especially when folks are, a lot of folks are working online, students are online. And then maybe the most important one, what if I fail? So we'll, we'll talk a lot about failure here. Um, that'll be our last, our last segment for this webinar. So what is project-based learning? We refer to project-based learning as an instructional approach in which students learn by applying skills and knowledge to an authentic situation, problem, or challenge. That they're taking what they're learning in classrooms, they actually have to use that information. They have to use that knowledge uh, in a way that is authentic. It's really the way we, we learn all the time as adults. You know, in, in simplest terms, it's what we're always doing. We're, we're, we're taking our knowledge and we have to solve real problems. And that's what we want students to do. And that's, that's really at the heart of project-based learning. So there are a lot of different frameworks to PBL that are out there, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. Uh, if you just do a quick Google search, you'll find a, a bunch of different ones. Probably the most popular one you would see would be from PBL Works. There are a lot of different kinds from high quality PBL to define learning. Um, there's many different ones out there. Um, everyone has a slightly different framework, slightly different language, but project-based learning, the key elements, I, I like to think of it as, uh, it's kind of like baking a cake, like certain, you, you're always gonna have certain ingredients. They might have different names, you know, but you're always going to have your flour, your, your sugar, right? Your, maybe your chocolate, you know, uh, but you're, we're going to give them different names, but they're, they're, they're all the same kind of elements. You'll see the same terms emerge all the time and you get used to kind of the key pieces of PBL, no matter the terminology. Uh, so we do use our own terms, use the ones that work for you. When we talk about project-based learning, these are the, the nine terms that we use. Student voice and choice, driving question, real world connection, Etc. Um, we try to use this language just because we feel it's it's pretty accessible, um, but it's also not uh, it's not the end all be all. It's just the terminology that we use, and that's what we'll be talking about today when we talk about key elements of PBL. So we're going to briefly walk through what some of these are. Learning outcomes, right? I think everybody who's on this webinar is familiar, but we put it we include learning outcomes because when we talk to folks about PBL, sometimes there's an impression that learning outcomes are standards. They're not, that they're not included in PBL, that somehow they get left out. But really, they're the, they're the backbone. It's where you, that's how you build your project. Starting with, what do I want my students to learn? What do I want them to be able to do, right? What do I want them to be able to demonstrate when this is over? So learning outcomes are the foundation for projects. And then from there, you have your driving question. It's open-ended. It's something hopefully that draws students in uh, to the work, something they're inspired, a question they're inspired to answer, they're excited to answer, hopefully. And it's not a question that has a right or wrong answer. You can't go on Google and find the answer to it. Uh, it's, you know, I've heard a lot from folks lately, you know, working online, the students, you know, they're able to go on and find the answers. You know, they can cheat. Well, 
With a good driving question, they can't because it's it's something that doesn't have one correct answer. You know, students are going to always be able to put their own kind of spin on how they address that driving question. And then what ties in very closely to your driving question is a real world connection. I'm taking what you're doing in the classroom and extending it beyond into the world. Now, it doesn't have to be, and when we talk about real world connection, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, making your classroom more like more like a, an office or work or workspace or you know adult workspace. It can be, you know, a real world connection can be within the, the school itself. We've worked with schools where they have where there's their math students in high school where. Uh, Looking at sustainability in their in their in their cafeteria, and they were out weighing garbage every day, tracking stats. You know, their real world connection was right there. It's just down the hallway, but it was real, right? They were when they were plotting their data, it was real data. It was coming from in their building. Um, it was authentic, you know. And what's crazy, they did all this, and they looked, and they had twenty seven thousand pounds of garbage waste they had each year. That for and that was eye opening, right? For students, that was a great hook for them. So real world connection can look many different ways. But no matter what, it's going beyond just what students are learning in their textbooks or just in their classroom. It's taking it to that next step. How is it actually applied somewhere else in the world? Student voice and choice, we talked about this a little bit during the chat. But you know, as educators, we all have some level of bias in our own interests and what we think is most important in a classroom, what's most important in our content, it's really valuable, if you will, especially if you're looking at student engagement, to invite their opinions, their interests, their strengths into the work that you're doing. That doesn't mean that students make all the decisions in project-based learning, but it can take a lot of, it's a kind of a spectrum. You know, voice and choice could be students choosing who they get to work with on their projects, or it could be choosing what resources they engage with, or the uh, method that they demonstrate their learning. Maybe some students don't want to write a paper, maybe they want to do a documentary. That's great. You know, students can demonstrate how their understanding in many different ways. So voice and choice can take many different forms. Research. So after you have students engaged with that driving question, they're gonna have a lot more questions. This is where those need to knows come into play, right? If you launch a driving question and you know, ask students like, how can we make our school more sustainable? They're gonna have to ask a lot more questions after that to figure out the answer. Um, so they, it spins off a cycle of questions and answers, finding resources, asking more questions. Now, brainstorming. This is one I feel like that gets left over a lot. We kind of skip this one a lot. In our past trainings, we didn't used to talk about brain, drain, brainstorming so much, but as Sarah and I have worked with more folks, we've realized this is a key element that people often skip. Kids will, will get their driving question, they'll do some research, and boom, we have the answer. We find it's really valuable to take some time, pump the brakes, and do what we call divergent thinking. So ask students to generate lots of ideas first. Let's come up with a lot of different solutions. You know, this is that period where there's no bad ideas. Then then we can pare them down and see which one might answer our driving question the best. Now we're not going to watch these videos, but they will be included in your resources. I mentioned we do a lot of design thinking work. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, we love structured brainstorming strategies. So things like morphological charts or lotus blossom uh, brainstorming sessions, they're great ways to kind of guide students through that process of generating a lot of ideas. Um, so we have a lot of these, these kind of video resources. They'll be, in the, they'll be in, the, uh, in the recording when we send it to you, so you can check those out. So after students have generated a lot of ideas, they've done that brainstorming, they might have a few ideas they really think they want to run with that can answer that driving question. That's where feedback and revision comes into play. This is where students are sharing their ideas. They're getting input. They're getting feedback from other folks. It could be from their peers. It could be from, from you, their educators. Uh, when we're working with business folks in our projects, a lot of times that feedback comes directly from the folks out in the field because they have that kind of expertise. It gives kind of an extra authentic edge to what they're, the, the feedback, feedback that they're providing. And it encourages students, you know, to kind of break out of that traditional mentality of, I did the work, I took the test, I'm done, right? Instead, you have your first idea, you share it, people are going to give you feedback, and the gate, and it's not over, right? I have to incorporate that into my work, I make changes, and my work improves. It's a great way to kind of give students that growth mindset. Like, I'm not done, I can always do better, 
and that my peers and, and the information that folks share with me, it's not a bad thing. It's not a criticism. It's actually a strength. It's a way to make my work better. And just as before, we have some other resources on feedback. If you're interested, we find there's a lot that, that folks are always looking for. So uh, we have some videos here on Rose Thorn Bud, which is one type of very simple uh, feedback uh, where you use kind of the positives, negatives, and opportunities. And then the thinking hats, which is a really fun activity for students, really accessible. I know we have some folks on here for elementary. The thinking hats would be so much fun if you're looking for feedback strategies. You know, every student gets kind of a different hat. They have a different lens. And they, they get to give feedback for being, you know, positive, being the pessimist, being, uh, you know, the reporter. They get to ask all the questions. They're really, really great, but they're great structured feedback protocols. And then reflection. In some cases, we've worked with folks, there's a perception that reflection comes at the end of a project. We really think that reflection is valuable by doing it throughout, you know, taking in little pieces. Reflection is, if, if you're a teacher starting out with PBL, reflection might be one of the greatest tools you can have because it's a great way to uh, hear from your students. It helps spot red flags in, in a PBL project. Um, it helps students set their own goals. You know, students have to think about what's going on in their project. When we take students on, on field trips, using reflection is so valuable. You know, it's awesome. Often students will go on a field trip and they come back and go, what happened? I don't know, it was great, it was fun. But like, what did you learn? What, what information did you gather? What will you need to use tomorrow? What goals can you set? Right? So reflection plays a, a major role throughout any project. And the good news is if you're looking for reflection strategies, uh, I feel like the one-stop shop is, is uh, Harvard's Project Zero. If you're, if you're familiar, um, it's a, it's a, they have a, uh, a thinking routines toolbox that has just a reflection protocol for just about any situation and any content area. I, I think they're fantastic. So I'll leave that there. Feel free to check that out. I think it's a great thing if you're looking for, for reflection strategies. And then the last piece, I think it's our last piece, uh, is public presentation. So when students are doing their work traditionally, you know, again, they take that test, or they create their project, they get a grade, it goes in a you know, filing cabinet. With a public presentation, one, it gives kind of an extra accountability to what students are doing. If they have an authentic audience, um, they realize that the work they, they're doing also has that, that purpose. They're doing it not just for them, they're doing it for someone else, right? And they have to demonstrate, it's just where they demonstrate their understanding of the content. So when we take this all the way back to learning outcomes, this is the public presentation is where students actually have to show that understanding. So it's a key piece. Not that they just solve the, the, the driving question, but that they, they show what they have learned. And a public presentation can take many different forms. So Sarah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Whew. Now, I've been talking quite a lot. But one thing I want to say, because when we go through all these elements, it can be a little overwhelming. It is 100% okay to not do PBL 100%. Okay? I want, to, I want to really emphasize that. Because there's a lot of moving parts to this kind of work. And it's okay. You don't have to do all these things all the time. You're not failing if, you, if you're not hitting all those cylinders at once. Sometimes we refer to this as the dimmer switch approach. You know, some elements will be a little brighter in certain projects. Maybe you'll have an opportunity for, for more voice and choice in a certain project than others. Maybe you'll have an opportunity for more for students to really dig into research in one project versus another, depending on your time frame, right? Or maybe your authentic audience might be a little different. You know, sometimes many students are presenting to parents, maybe they're presenting to a business. Maybe they're presenting, sometimes we have students in upper grades, sometimes their, their authentic audience is, is teaching younger students. So it can change depending on the project you have, but it's all right. Each one of these, each one of these elements will help make instruction better in a classroom. So with that, I have spoken enough. I'm going to turn this over to Sarah. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, so I'm gonna pick it up with um, where the misconceptions are. So as we all know, PBL, there's a lot of misconceptions and we just wanted to like hit a few of them face just right there. So here's the deal with PBL. Um, it's not just another education fad. Um, it's not a, an, an additional thing to do. Um, folks, uh, are a lot of 
a lot of times concerned about the amount of time it will take to do PBL. And really what PBL does is it's just a, a shift in your pedagogy. It's just a new way of doing something you've always done. And the other thing is uh, most, a lot of folks think that you can, that, you know, you can't have direct instruction. Um, we are huge proponents of direct instruction when direct instruction is appropriate. Um, we giggle with math instructors all the time because sometimes you just need to direct instruct trinomials. Like it's a thing and that's okay. Um, sometimes students need a quiz. That is also okay. Um, so don't go, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, PBL and its elements is a strategy that can be added to an educator's toolbox. Those of us that uh, talk about PBL, we, you know, tout these big monster and in insane projects. And I think um, it does a disservice to folks that are starting out because um, not every project um, has to be an entire semester and, you know, end with a moonshot student solution. Um, these projects can be small. They can last a day or two. They um, don't have to end world hunger. I mean, if your kids end up doing that, yay for them, but they don't have to. That doesn't have to be the total outcome. Um, they can address just a couple of small scale outcomes. You know, for example, if you had a three day project that maybe the only purpose of the project is just to get your kids to collaborate. That's all, that's perfectly acceptable. PBL uh, can assess your curriculum standards as well. Um, entire projects can be built around standards. You identify those standards and you build a project around it. Um, these are those, those learning outcomes. What do you want your students to know? And a lot of times we hear that, well, I have a high absentee rate, it's difficult to do group work. Well, the best thing about PBL is the allowing more voice and choice. So for those students that do struggle getting to school, well, there can be ways that they can have independent work and still participate in a PBL. So it just depends on how the project is designed and developed. So where do you start in terms of a PBL project? Um, you don't have to do all of this in order, all of these elements in order, in order to begin your PBL practice. Um, and you can build your practice over time. Again, this is a totally different way of teaching. So it's important to start small and to be gentle on yourself um, by incorporating a couple of elements into your current instruction. So for example, if you want your kids to do group work, fantastic. Um, science teacher, always having kids do group work. Um, my students probably could have benefited a lot from, you know, reflecting, right? So how can I get reflection into my classroom? What are some strategies that I can use? And slowly you build it up and you do more and more and more. So part of this is really, you know, having the growth mindset. Um, it's not just important for teachers or students to have a growth mindset, but teachers should as well. Um, and really just taking it step by step and bringing one or two elements into the current instruction that you have can have a wonderful positive impact. And it also increases your confidence in using those elements so that slowly you start to want to use more. And before you know it, you've made an entire PBL project. So if you're trying to, for example, increase your student engagement, which we have heard time and time again, especially now, it is very difficult to get students engaged. Fair enough, um, that is a legit concern we are all seeing. Um, maybe considering uh, bringing in elements into your current instruction that, you know, offer up real world connections, show students value in the content that you are teaching, not just the, why do I have to learn about this thing? Um, but there's a reason for it. Um, maybe uh, learning more about the interests of your students and how can, you can craft a driving question uh, for a current instruction um, around those, around what your students are interested in and even just allowing for some voice and choice. And sometimes there's this misconceptions centered around voice and choice that students just get like full reign to do whatever they want. The voice and choice can be very simple as you have three different ways that you can do this homework. You can send it to me written form, you can tell it to me, or you can do a video, whatever, right? So voice and choice can also um, be curated as well, but it allows students to engage with the information on, uh, in a space that is comfortable for them. If you're looking to build soft skills, um, you can do that by, you know, looking at more brainstorming um, protocols and strategies, some feedback and revision strategies, reflection, which is a disposition that just not students need to know, but also adults should be working on. 
as well as, you know, how can you bring in public presentation? And there's many different ways that students can present their learnings. And again, what are some ways you can offer a voice and choice? So then their engagement is there, right? So there's different ways that um, you can use growth mindset with, your, with not just yourself, but also your students in terms of um, bringing PBL into your classroom. So how might you get started? A few considerations to think about, keep in mind. If you have a traditional, you've done a traditional project in the past, right? All educators, we've all had those projects that we loved. I love doing Rube Goldbergs with my students. It was an awesome time. Um, however, how could I maybe modify what I was doing in my Rube Goldberg project um, to include more elements of PBL. Personally, I, again, would have worked in way more reflection. Um, we had a lot of trial and error, but definitely way more reflection and probably in a written form as well, or even in, you know, audio. Um, I could have looked at, you know, the topics that my kids were most interested in, um, something that they were already engaged about. You know, we've talked about a lot of times for elementary school. I mean, you can't go wrong with animals. Elementary kids love the animals. So how can, if you already know your students really enjoy animal topics, bring in and develop a project that's more focused on animals? The other thing is, what could you do that your students, um, a project based on if your topics or students typically struggle with? Your students already struggle with it, you know, ultimately what do you have to lose? Try something different, right? So how might you um, make sure that your students stay on course? And this is something that we hear all the time. Um, we'll have projects that'll last three weeks and um, we'll have educators that will tell their students to go and then the kids will just kind of spin and they, they won't know what to do. Um, so there's a couple of different suggestions that we have. Um, we are huge into rubrics. If you can identify what your key learning outcomes are, then create a rubric around that and be able to use that um, at the end of the project. Again, how do you know that your kids have learned all of these things? Have a rubric and identify those learning outcomes like first thing. And then you can use checklists to set clear expectations for work along the way. So for example, you can set like short-term and long-term deadlines and short-term meaning like at the end of class today, you will give me A, B, and C. Long-term deadlines could be at the end of this week, you will have done A, B, C, and D. And make sure that you are checking in early and often with your students. So virtually speaking, that could be done in breakout rooms, small groups. Um, if you are face-to-face -face with your students, you know, just going around each group. How is everybody doing? Answering their questions. And if you're starting to notice that they're missing something, they, they need more help with this, well then stop and address that at that time so that those um, issues that the students might be having don't snowball into something that cannot be manageable towards the end of the project. So one of um, the ways that you can, you know, ask your students to reflect and to learn more about where they are at is by allowing reflection moments, which can also be changed for assessments as well. Um, but really, a Rose Learn Bud is a really easy way to ask your students to reflect, and it can be done with students of all ages. We have seen first graders do a Rose Learn Bud, and it's so much fun, and they're so adorable. But a Rose Learn Bud is really your pinks are your positives, your negatives are your blues, and your opportunities are your greens. And you just ask students to reflect on an experience, uh, a, a thing that they have done, and really just gather, like, where are they at? If you notice that there's a lot of blues centered around one big theme, maybe that might be something we want to address as a class so that everybody, all misconceptions for students can be addressed at that time, and then we can all move on in the project together. So here are some examples of students using a rose thorn bud. These are actually um, from when our students went to uh, tour the nuclear power plant. They had actually had a presentation that was given um, by the nuclear company about nuclear power and they started to rose thorn bud the information that they just um, were, were given. Um, so that was really fun to see how their little brains were working and how they interpreted the information that they were given. So how can I balance relevance and rigor? And this is something, again, we get a lot of. Relevance helps um, if you know your students really well. Um, so you survey them, you have small group conversations, you ask them for feedback, and then you act upon that feedback. Um, if you know what, what excites your kids and what, gets, what they're interested in, um, it helps in terms of relevance. And it also 
um, helps you reflect on aspects of your instruction where you know you can address the things that they're excited in to offer up some more voice and choice for them. And the way that you can offer up more voice and choice is really how do you give your students an opportunity to present or to demonstrate their learning? Um, there are many ways that students can present their learning. You know, they could make videos on their phones. They could do audio or podcasts. Um, they could even go so far as to make their own apps or, you know, engage with a new technology, all in terms of just sharing what they have learned with an authentic audience. So in terms of rigor, as we've talked about before, designing a rubric that focuses on your key learning outcomes should be the first and foremost thing um, that is done early. And that is to say, rubrics are tough. They are tough to build out, at least initially. Um, it, takes a, it takes some time and it definitely takes like your special rubric hat to wear um, when you are developing your first couple of rubrics. Um, though I do think that in the end, um, the more and more rubrics you develop, the more and more wording you have that you like to use more often, right? As your students are engaging with different projects. So it does get easier, you know, like pretty much anything you do, the more you practice, the better it gets. Um, and the whole idea is that again, the rubrics are what skills or standards do you want your students to be able to demonstrate by the end. And when you combine a rubric with a checklist, the checklist would focus on specific examples of student work. So if your rubric is going to include your standards from your curriculum, a checklist might be used to make sure that, for example, your student presentations include a works cited page, multimedia, and an, and, and, and an introduction. They either have it or they don't, right? So that would be a checklist. And these can be uh, different types of assessments that can be used together over the course of a project. So how can I keep my students engaged? So, Erin was able to find a, a little bit of research on um, engagement, especially now. And really all these lovely circles just mean is that there's a lot of different um, things out there that are gonna motivate students, especially online. Um, PBL isn't going to solve all of this, but it definitely can help. So if a student, which is in blue, um, they are influenced a lot of times by, you know, self-efficacy and motivation, um, their interests, right? Who they are as a person, their identity. Well, sometimes a PBL project when developed um, in certain ways can definitely address some of those aspects, right? So it's a, just another way that you can increase your students' engagement ultimately just by kind of meeting them where they're at and um, making those connections for them um, so that they see relevance in it and they, they want to do the project because it's fun, because it's something they're interested in. So if you're looking to increase engagement, we would recommend that you start with smaller projects. Again, please don't make your very first PBL six months long, maybe a couple of days, start small. Um, and try to plan for and celebrate small little wins with the students because that will help build their agency and then they'll want to keep engaging in the project. And lastly, always try and keep an eye out for student voice and choice opportunities. So that comes down to you can do A, B, or C. I don't care which one you do, but you have a choice, right? So. Again, student voice and choice doesn't have to be huge. We have um, some, some teachers that have said they've actually used um, student voice and choice in developing a driving question. That's totally fine if your kids can do that. You can also come up with your own driving question. That's totally appropriate. So it just really depends on your students. And I really think um, because it is a different way for them to engage in their content, it also takes a little bit of time for them to get confidence when they are also engaging with PBL. So everybody's learning together and that's totally appropriate. All right, so most importantly, what if I fail? This is a, a favorite quote of ours um, from Zaretta Hammond. She um, actually wrote, if you have not written, uh, read, excuse me, the culturally responsive uh, teaching and the brain. Uh, Zaretta is fantastic. She's wonderful to follow. But um, we were all listening to a webcast or a webinar that she was on. And she um, said, had this quote, I call it the first pancake, right? Nobody gets upset because the first pancake is burnt on one side or gooey or beige on the other. Nobody says shut down the kitchen. And really that just means like we're all gonna fail. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try again. The more you try, the better it will get, right? So with that and keeping that in mind, especially when starting out with PBO, no project is ever going to be a complete failure. We have teachers that do project year after year after year. And before the students present, they're always like, 
I'm so worried. I don't know how this is going to go. And then at the end, they're like, oh, they did wonderful. It was great. They did such a great job. That's always how the projects work. You would be surprised what your students can do. Um, however, every project is going to have little minuscule failures, um, as well as minuscule successes, right? So it's going to be a mixture of both. Um, it's important to take time to reflect on what worked in your project, what didn't work so well, and what are you going to change for next time? And really, that's no different than any one of us doing a lesson plan for the first time, right? This is what we do. We always modify it because, you know, second period isn't going to be able to do that aspect. And Lord knows seventh period, there is no way. So I'm going to have to address it like this. So it's really important that it's it's okay to know that nothing's gonna be perfect and there's nothing wrong with you as an educator. You are doing a wonderful job. Um, so, but be prepared, right? Things aren't always gonna to go to plan. It's also a really great opportunity to encourage your, your students to give feedback because they're gonna know when things didn't feel right as well. So how can you address those pain points for them um, the next time you do the project? So, we have this little video, and yes, we have time for it. Woohoo! Um, this is a great video. Um, you can actually find it online. Um, it's called Getting Smart, and it's really uh, the idea behind this bike that he um, rides is actually quite wonderful. So I'm going to play the video. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I sure. couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm sick. All right, so, uh, whatever you're at. Yeah. Wait, wait. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. <laughs> Dude, all right, here we go. Just give it a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Like, you gotta start rolling at least. Here we go. And go. Oh, God. All right, back up. Okay, wait. Keep your feet on the pedal. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to.
So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned all right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, it clicked. It clicked. Hold on, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Okay, I can ride a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yeah. You think I'm faking, you don't believe me. That looks so Actually. weird, you were like, blah, blah, and it's full. You think I'm lying, don't you? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin, you're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. All right, so the whole point of that awesome video is really just to remember to have a growth mindset, right? Like teaching the way that you've been teaching and that we traditionally teach is done in, in a specific way. And it is really hard to change your headspace. So it's all about learning, right? And it's gonna take some time. Um, but we enjoy this video a lot. We actually went out and had a bike made. So we have a backwards bike if anybody wants to try it. Um, we like to bring it to our trainings because it's a lot of fun. But Really at this point and with the time that we have left, what additional questions do you have about implementing PBL in your classroom? We wanted to make sure that we took some time to address any burning questions that you maybe came up um, while we were going through our presentation. Oh, excellent. Is there any good resource out there for ideas for projects? Um, I think a lot of times, um, I know for me particularly, um, when that question comes up, my next question to you is, well, what content do you teach? And <laughs> what grade do you teach? So um, I will say that uh, PBL Works actually has a whole library of um, different projects um, that you can access for free. 
which is always great. All they want is like an email address and you just log in um, and you have access to those um, different, uh, it's organized by content, by grade. Um, so it's a good place to get you started. Um, there's always us. We love talking about this stuff. So if you have an idea and you want to run something by us, like we are always available. Um, we will never leave you in the PBL world by yourself. Um, so even now, if you'd like to, you know, have conversations, you know, in a different way, like that's totally fine. Um, we are here to assist. There are examples in world languages. You'll also find those in PBL works as well. They have them organized um, by world language, which is very cool. Uh, good question about PSSA scores. Yes. Um, you know, best answer I can give you right now is the research is mixed, you know, honest answer. Um, there is a fair amount, I would say, uh, to support improvement for students in terms of engagement in class and, and uh, retention, particularly because the way the brain works, thinking about when students have to apply what they're learning across different contexts, it has a tendency, their, what they learn tends to stick longer. They retain the information longer. But in terms of standardized tests, I would say the results are, I wouldn't say the results are uh, entirely in yet. Uh, in terms of curriculum, you know, being particularly strict in a district, you know, as Sarah talked about before, I think one of the best things that any educator can do is look at building in some of these elements individually into your, into your practice. You know, look for those small opportunities. Uh, where can I add a new reflection method to, you know, my exit ticket for the day? Where, if I'm doing a writing project with my students, can I inject a little bit of, of a brainstorming method into my work to help students generate more ideas? You know, if you have a little bit of wiggle room, looking for that authentic connection. Anybody who's looking for uh, real world connections in some fashion, we really think that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a great place to start. Um, there's 17 different goals, if you're not familiar. Um, we'll include them in the resources when we send out our uh, follow-up to everyone. But it's a great, the 17 UN goals provide a great lens for, for students to engage and apply. I, I would challenge any educator to not find some connection to goals around you know hunger and water quality and you know, life on earth and life in the water and, you know, improved education and uh, gender equality, all these different UN goals tie into subject matter in so many different ways. So if you're not familiar, definitely check it out. And there's actually a lot of great project uh, resources too. Uh, that we can share. You definitely bring up a really good point um, that teachers don't feel like they have the time, right, due to their scheduling. Um, and there's definitely things that um, administrators can offer to teachers to give them some space in when they're learning about this. Um, you know, having block scheduling, yes, is it is it difficult to change folk schedules? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, creating cohorts with, you know, your early adopters, you know, giving them the room to fail, um, that is also very helpful for them. And, and we'll start, you know, slowly getting folks there. If there is um, anyone else who has other questions or you want to continue chatting with us, um, this is where you can find us on all the platforms um, as well as our website. Um, and we really thank you all for being here today. So thanks so much. Keep an eye out. We'll have some training opportunities and we'll uh, be sure to share our, our uh, grad level course registration if you have any, if you know any, if you are, or if you know any early career teachers interested in PBL. Again, that'll be a free, a free uh, opportunity, training opportunity with seed money. If anybody wants to hang out and chat afterwards about anything in particular, we'll be here.